Soteriology 101 podcast, where God is most glorified by his love and provision for all people. Welcome your host, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptists, an adjunct professor of theology and a local teaching pastor, Dr. Leighton Flowers. Hello, my name is Leighton Flowers, the Director of Apologetics for Texas Baptist. And yes, you're going to hear directly from John Lennox. I did a video on Ravi Zacharias' view of uh, Calvinism, and I just read an article from him. Some people didn't uh, like that um, because they thought they were going to hear from Ravi himself. And I understand that. Whenever I click on a YouTube video, I want to hear what it looks like I'm going to hear. Um, And so you're going to actually hear John Lennox here explain his perspective. Now, let me just say something. This older generation of apologists like John Lennox and Ravi Zacharias are that these guys oftentimes remain conciliatory uh, when it comes to the major debates. If you go to um, Dr. Zacharias' website, he doesn't really take a side with regard to Calvinism. But when you listen to his defense of free will, when you listen to his interpretations of Romans 9 and 2 Peter 3, 9 and the other passages, my argument is, and um, and I still stand by this, um, he teaches and believes like we as traditionalists do. He doesn't fall into the pure Armenian camp or the pure Calvinist camp. He takes a conciliatory road and doesn't really commit to anybody one way or the other because I, you know, that doesn't, that's not really what his focus is and that's not what he wants to be focused on. And a lot of the older uh, generation of, of apologists, they've kind of taken that road on that particular issue. Just kind of, let's just not get into that. John Lennox, is in the same kind of camp. He doesn't come right out and say Calvinism or you know, Arminianism. He doesn't use those vernacular, but his interpretations and his words very clearly align with the free will um, view of God's creation, a, uh, an affirmation of, of choice uh, in the way that we would define it. And when you listen to his words, it becomes very evident that he does not hold to the same views of men like John Piper, for example who very clearly deny the, con- the concept of self-determination or the ability of free will as, as typically defined by philosophers like John Lennox. And so with that in mind, keep, keep in mind, he's not going to get specific and talk about specifically Calvinism, but he's going to very clearly defend the doctrine of free will as we would understand it. And he's going to give some really great explanations, in my estimation, of how to deal with these tough issues from uh, the perspective of, of an apologist dealing also with uh, atheists, as well as how to just answer very tough philosophical questions. Let's tune in and listen. Talk to me about a God who created the atom. That's right. Who upholds the universe. Who invented light. Who painted every color who invented the human mind. Why couldn't he then have made a universe that didn't get itself into such a mess? Couldn't God have made beings that didn't sin, that didn't destroy each other? My answer may shock you. Of course he could. (coughs) Of course he could. We make them, you know, in laboratories. We call them robots. Of course you can make beings that are non-moral. But now I have a wife, and I've been married to the same one for 44 years, which isn't bad, is it? (laughs) Now you imagine if I had a robotic wife. A very sophisticated one with the the proper screen and, you know, all the kind of sophisticated iPad technology. So I go back from Rice University and my wife comes to the door. There's the screen all glowing and I see a word marked kiss. So I go, kiss. And I get a beautiful robotic kiss. (laughs) Well, why are you laughing? But you say, would that be a real kiss? Well, they're making robots that are very similar to human beings these days. But you know that it wouldn't be real because there's no choice in the matter. She's programmed to do what she does. Now, let me explain it carefully. Of course God could make a universe 
with creatures in it that in that sense cannot sin. There are loads of them, animals. When the lion eats your head off at the zoo because you put it between the bars, we don't put him in the high court. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I think C.S. Lewis helped me a great deal here. I don't think it's the final answer, but it's a way in to see that in order to make beings that have the capacity to love, they must have the capacity to hate. If you're going to have the capacity to say yes, you must have the capacity to say no. And you say, well, why did God do that? Why do you have children? Never forget holding my first child in my arms and realizing that I have brought this little girl into the world. She could grow up to say no to me. Why take the risk? Do you ever think about it? Why do we do it, ladies and gentlemen? Because we realize that granted the risk, the benefits outweigh the risk. To live in a world where love is possible, we all crave for a world in which love is actualized. And you hope one day, maybe you've already got there, you students at Rice, that you'll meet somebody and fall in love with them and they'll fall in love with you and they'll value you and they'll choose you. And the value of that, and you know that it's got an inherent risk. God took a risk to make a universe with people in it made in his image, capable of choosing, capable of saying yes to God, and equally capable of saying no, moral beings. One of the big questions that rises is justice. Now, Dawkins says there is no justice. And if atheism is true, ladies and gentlemen, the vast majority of people will never get justice. And if there is no life after this life, there's no life to get justice in. So they will never get justice. And yet our human hearts, they cry out for justice. They sense that we live in a moral universe, that there must be something somewhere. Otherwise, our notion of justice is a sheer illusion, and it mocks us. What can atheism say in the context of massive injustice? Hitler murders six million Jews and then he takes a gun and he blows his head off and he's got away with it because he will never have to face any ultimate question of responsibility. Is that true? I think there's something in every human being that says that cannot be true. Now, of course, a feeling in our hearts that something cannot be true doesn't mean it isn't true. But as C.S. Lewis pointed out, it would be very strange. If in a world where we find ourselves with an appetite for food, there was no food. In a world where we find an appetite for sex, there was no sex. In a world where we find we have an appetite for friendship and justice and morality, there was none. He said it would be a very strange world. And Richard Dawkins said to me once, yes, the picture I paint is bleak, but that doesn't mean it's false. I said, Richard, it doesn't mean it's true either. <laughs> there's another question we can ask, and that is this. Granted that there's a risk, did God make any provision if things went wrong? I love that question. You see, even free will points us to Christ, the provision. This is one of the reasons that uh, if you don't like the term traditionalism, I love the term provisionalism. Uh, and it, you don't have to limit it to Southern Baptist traditionalists. You can call yourself a provisionalist. In other words, I believe that God provides all that is needed for every man, woman, boy, and girl for them to experience life uh, everlasting, that, that God ha provides all that we need. That, I, I love the term provisionalist. Um, if, if I could rename traditionalist to provisionalist so that people couldn't come around saying, hey, well, we're, this SBC was started by Calvinist, or, you know, and get into all that debate. Who cares? 
call us provisionalist, all right? I, I would be glad to take on that name. It's a great term to describe our, our view because God in his graciousness, not by, by, because he's obligated to, because he's a loving God and chooses to, he provides the means by which everyone may be saved. Um, and, and, I, and I love his explanations in there um, on the doctrine of free will, the, referring to C.S. Lewis and the, what real love and relationship looks like. You ask any kid, do you want this real puppy or do you want this um, fake puppy that looks just, they look exactly alike. This one's fake. This one's not real. This one's just a stuffed animal, but it's not going to poop on your, your, your carpet. It's not going to chew up your favorite toys. Um, it's not going to ever do anything you don't want it to do. It'll do exactly what you want it to do. And do you want this fake puppy? It'll, it'll only move when you want it to move. It'll only do what you want it to do. Or do you want this real puppy over here that's trying to get away? <laughs> Which one do you want? Every kid's going to choose the real puppy. Why? Why? Because it's love worth having. That's why. That's why we believe in free will. That's why we believe that people can make their own determinations as to who they worship and serve. And this concept and idea that God irresistibly or effectually changes you to make you want him... Um, and makes kind of this really a world of automaton that um, C.S. Lewis uses it as whenever you take it, it to that, that far of a view to understand that we are um, truly responsible people. Um, I, I was going to mention, too, that um, from Ravi Zacharias's response to the concept of free will and his videos on free will, type in Ravi Zacharias and free will and and you'll hear that the ethic of love and his explanation of what that means and the importance of that. Um, and he, he actually refers to in the article that I read in that other um, video, um, a, a quote from a J.I. Packer. And, and because he quotes J.I. Packer, some people thought, well, well, that must mean he's a Calvinist because J.I. Packer is a Calvinist. Remember, though, uh, you go back and watch the video with J.I. Packer, and J.I. Packer just holds to what he calls an antinomy. Where he's there's this 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 unknown this two parallel lines that mean in eternity kind of a thing, and we just believe that God's sovereign, and that man's responsible. Well, all of us can say that we believe God's sovereign and man's responsible. The question is if you define sovereignty to mean meticulous divine control, and you define free will as not really free will as Rabbi Zacharias does or John Lennox does, and you redefine free will to people doing what they want to do, but their wants are ultimately determined by their God. Um, then yeah, you can you can pretend like, or at least make it sound like you believe in true free will, by by redefining free will to be acting according to desires that God is ultimately controlling you to have. But that that's not freedom. That's not the freedom of the will as defined by Rabbi Zacharias, William Lane Craig, John Lennox, or any other notable apologist and philosopher out there. And so this concept, don't let, don't let Calvinists redefine free will to mean something it does not mean. Free will is the, is the contra-causal ability to refrain or not refrain from a given moral action. It's the ability to make a real choice. Look up the word choice in Webster's. That's free will. The, the ability to choose between um, among available options. It's not being controlled by your greatest preset desire. That's called animal instinct. Lions <laughs> have animal instinct. Okay, animals choose according to instinct. They ref, they 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 have reflexive desires. They don't they don't deliberate. They don't reason. They don't they don't choose. We do. We we have many competing desires, and we choose which of those desires we're going to act to fulfill. This concept, this circular argument that we will always choose according to our greatest preset desire. And how do you know what your greatest preset desire is? Well, because that's the one you choose. And how do you, why did you choose it? Because it's your greatest. It's a circular argument. It's, it's, it's nonsensical. It means absolutely nothing to say that we choose according to our greatest preset desire because the only way you know what your greatest preset desire is because you chose it. And you're just assuming by begging the question that it wasn't your choice to act upon that desire versus some other one you could have acted upon. And that's what separates us from the animals. We are moral beings because we have the power of self-determination. This is a part of the Imago Dei. We were created in the image of God to be able to make real choices, to choose which of the desires that are competing within us to act upon. And that's our responsibility. That's why we're held responsible for our choices. I want to play one last video in closing from John Lennox, who's asked a question about uh, apologetics and about the free will of man and the sovereignty of God and how to deal with that even from the atheist who asked that question. Tune in and listen to this. 
John Lennox has a triple doctorate in the fields of science and math and is a professor at Oxford University. Today we're going to hear him answer questions from the audience after a lecture he gave on Genesis chapter 37. That chapter raises many questions that we're still debating today, but Dr. Lennox handles them eloquently with his remarkable intellect and wit. Let's get right to the first question. You touched on this a little bit this morning, but it's about God's sovereignty versus humans' free will. Yes. And I'm in a dialogue with an atheist, and he's a brilliant guy, really is. And I have my own ways of responding to him, but I want to know what you would say if he says that how can God be sovereign over everything if he's an all-powerful God and also not have given us a deterministic how does God give us free will and not ha- not be all powerful and also if God knew that humanity was going to screw up we we're going to sin then how is it fair for God knowing that was going to happen to punish humanity for its sins so again I, I have responded in some ways to him and I think it's pretty comprehensive I just wanted to hear what you I think it's that. pretty comprehensive how many hours have you got <laughs> Now that is an immensely important question and it's in a sense one that we'll be dealing with gradually as we go through. But I'm very glad you posed it from the perspective of atheism. I want to say one basic thing about it first of all because I'll go more into detail and that is this. The way you phrased it is the way it's normally phrased. How could God be sovereign over history and give you free will? Well, when people ask me that question, I ask them, what is consciousness? And of course they tell me they don't know. They don't even know, our physicist friends, what energy is. Those are much simpler things than the question you have asked me. You asked me the question, how? Now, the how of these deep things There are many of them we just cannot answer. How did God speak the universe into existence? I don't know. But that he spoke it into existence, I do believe there's evidence for it. So I distinguish between the how and the that. And the importance of that is this, that you can see the evidence within scripture and within experience as well that that is the most sensible way to understand the universe in other words I take scripture seriously and when scripture tells me that God rules his kingdom is was and ever shall be I believe that when I hear the son of God stand on earth and say to Jerusalem how often I would have gathered you under my wings and you wouldn't I believe that too that we have a real capacity to say either yes or no to God how that works I don't know Let me illustrate that for you, because you might just find this useful. And stop me if I've said this yesterday, but I don't think I did. I did say it recently somewhere. Um, (laughs) I'm getting old. You You have to forgive me. But... I was asked at a big uh, lecture I gave to about 500 physicists, very senior physicists in England. A man came up to me afterwards and said, you know, that was a very interesting talk on science and religion, but I perceive that you are a Christian. I said, you're very sharp. (laughs) And he said, but look, he said, you know, as a Christian, you're obliged to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I said, that's right. He said, explain to me how that can be. And I said, well, very easily. But as a quid pro quo, I'll ask you a question. And so I asked him what consciousness was. And he said he didn't know. And then I asked him what energy was. And he says, well, we can measure it and use it. I said, that wasn't my question. What is it? He said, I don't know. So I said, that's interesting. But you believe in both consciousness and energy, don't you? And you don't know what they are. 
should I write you off as a physicist? (laughs) And he said, please don't. But I said, you were going to write me off five minutes ago. Because I couldn't explain to you how Jesus could be God and man at the same time. But you observe that I believe it quite correctly. Tell me, I said, why do you believe in consciousness and energy? Well, that was a bit too philosophical for him. So I had to help him because I'm a kind person at heart. (laughs) And I said, you believe them not because you understand them fully, but because of their explanatory power. He said, that's right. And I said, that's exactly why I believe that Jesus is both God and man. Not because I understand how. If we don't understand the nature of energy, how could we possibly understand the nature of God? But I believe it because there's evidence that it's true. Just as I believe that light is both waves and particles, however difficult I find that to get together. And you can see the relevance to your question. It's one of those questions where people, because they can't integrate it intellectually, tend to push to one side or the other. It seems to me that scripture teaches both things. And that these stories that we're looking at are an unpacking of how it works so that we can see how it relates to our lives.